everyone. Welcome to uh, part two of the chapter five lecture. So we left off on, um, <clears throat> we left off here with fat digestion. So some of this conversation around fat digestion will be a little bit of a review because we learned about digestion already in chapter three. So we'll review that fat digestion primarily takes place in the small intestine. Uh, I shouldn't really say that it begins here because let's see, right here, we'll remember that we have lingual lipase, lingual referring to the tongue, lipase, and the LIP referring to lipids, the ASC referring to enzymes, so lipid digesting enzymes that do occur in the mouth. So we do digest a little bit of triglyceride in the mouth. Um, and then in the stomach too, we do have a tiny bit of lipid digestion there as well because we have a gastric lipase, or again, a lipid digesting enzyme made in the stomach, gastric. But um, as we discussed in chapter three, the majority of digestion does take place in the small intestine. You might recall cholecystokinin and secretin, two of our hormones, that signal the secretion of bile from the gallbladder. Remember, bile gets secreted into the duodenum of the small intestine, um, and bile's job is fat emulsification. So bile emulsifies fat, which basically means breaking the large fat globules down into smaller droplets of fat so that the fat digesting enzymes can then actually access the fat pieces to digest them. And then in the pancreas, we'll see pancreatic enzymes, pancreatic lipases that will break fat um, down into the, the building blocks, basically. So break fat down into two fatty acids. And one of those fatty acids, one of the three, remember triglyceride is a glycerol and three fatty acids. So the final stage of fat digestion will, will yield two separated fatty acids, and then that third fatty acid, fatty acid will stay attached to the glycerol. So this term monoglyceride refers to one fatty acid that is still attached to the glycerol backbone. And so it's the two fatty acids and the monoglyceride that get absorbed into the enterocyte of the small intestine um, to then be absorbed into the, um, into the lymph and then into the bloodstream to be distributed throughout the body. So again, remember a tiny bit will occur in the mouth and the stomach with lingual lipase and gastric lipase. But then here, the major site of fat digestion is the stomach. So here's your triglyceride being digested down into a monoglyceride and two fatty acids. Um, we're also going to see breakdown of any cholesterol esters and any phospholipids that might have been in our food. So dietary cholesterol, remember we said that it exists as a cholesterol ester. So cholesterol, that three-ringed backbone attached to this um, ester or just a, a, you know, a little fatty acid chain basically. So then the final stage of cholesterol digestion will break the cholesterol apart from that little fatty acid chain. And then the phospholipid will break the phosphate head off um, from the glycerol backbone and separate off those two individual fatty acids. Um, over here on our accessory organs side, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So remember, food never passes through the accessory organs. So the liver makes bile, the gallbladder stores and secretes bile into the duodenum of the small intestine. Kind of happens like right here just behind this transverse colon. And the pancreas also will secrete some of its digestive enzymes into the duodenum of the small intestine. Um, yeah, and so then we have this concept of a micelle. So we're gonna look at this in a few different slides. So the micelle is what we do, if, well, let me say, we take all of these little end pieces of fat digestion, so all these, um, building blocks, and we will package them in the lumen of the small intestine. These will then get kind of combined um, with some bile components into these larger um, globules, I guess we could say, called micelles. So micelle is basically a package of free-floating fat components. 
So then the enterocyte, which are these little, you know, these little cells here, the enterocytes will absorb the micelles. So you can see the micelle coming into the enterocyte. And then the micelle is actually going to kind of dissociate inside of the enterocyte. And then all of these components of fat digestion will get repackaged into something called a chylomicron. So here you see chylomicron inside the enterocyte. And then the chylomicron will enter the lymph, so the lacteal of the lymph system, that smallest component, like that smallest um, vessel of the lymph system. And then eventually um, the lymph will drain into the bloodstream at the thoracic duct of the lymph system. Uh, and so eventually these chylomicrons will make their way into the blood. You'll notice here too, I've kind of covered it up now, but you'll notice this little piece here saying that short chain or showing that short chain fatty acids can actually absorb or yeah, be absorbed directly into the bloodstream. So short chain fatty acids do not get packaged into the micelles. They just go, they can go directly themselves. So remember, we also said that chain length determines the um, digestion of the and the absorption. So the shorter chain fatty acids can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream because they are small enough. Whereas those long chain fatty acids, like any of these fatty acid tails up here, if they're long chain, they need to um, be packaged into the micelle in order to be absorbed into the, uh, sorry, they need to be packaged into the chylomicron in order to be absorbed into the um, body systems. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's get these two straight. So micelle is what gets packaged actually inside the lumen of the small intestine, right? The micelle gets made in the lumen of the small intestine. It gets absorbed into the enterocyte. It then dissociates inside the enterocyte, and all those same components package up into a chylomicron. So the micelles capture lipid digestion project, products and transport them into the enterocyte. And then um, chylomicrons get produced in the enterocyte and then, you know, absorbed into the lacteal and ultimately into the bloodstream. So um, chylomicrons are composed of the fatty acid, like the end products of fat digestion, so all these fatty components, the fatty acids, the monoglycerides, the cholesterols, the cholesterol esters. Um, and then the outside of chylomicrons are phospholipids and proteins. So remember, phospholipids are water soluble and proteins, we haven't talked about these yet, but these are also water soluble. So proteins and phospholipids are water soluble. So that's how a chylomicron can travel in the blood is because the outer portion of the chylomicron is going to be water soluble and the inner portion is going to contain all the fatty components. And then we also have some lipoproteins, so lipo being, being fat and protein being protein. So these are other um, compounds that can transport lipids in the blood, again, because they have a water-soluble protein part that is attached to a lipid part that can carry the lipid component. Um, so understand the micelle and understand the chylomicron. I do have some more uh, We'll, we'll keep talking about these for a little bit though. So chylomicrons are packaged in the enterocyte. They then leave the enterocyte, they enter the lymphatic system, and I said they get transferred into the blood, the circulatory system, at the thoracic duct. Remember we said short and medium chain fatty acids can actually just be absorbed directly into the blood. They do not go into the chylomicrons. They're small enough that they can travel on their own. That's where a lipoprotein comes in. A lipoprotein could carry a short or a medium chain fatty acid through the blood. Um, so we, we will see another enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. And you don't necessarily need to know this one as, as well, but when the chylomicron is traveling through the blood and it wants to deliver its components to the body cells, we do need this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase will be able to break apart the chylomicron, thus allowing for some of the lipid components inside of it to enter into the body cells. 
So um, why do body cells want fat delivery? Chylomicron is basically a fat delivery system. You can think of it as like Uber for fat after your digestion, after a meal. So chylomicrons are delivering fat to your body cells. We need some fat, specifically triglycerides, because as we said, fat can be a source of energy. And of the three types of lipids we've learned about, triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols, triglyceride is the energy supplying lipid. Phospholipids and sterols are much more structural. So when we say used to make lipid containing compounds, um, triglycerides can be used for that too. Um, but we might, we would also use some of our uh, sterols, like I said, to make vitamin D or to make um, our sex hormones or to make bile. So the structural and functional um, uses of fat, that's really why we, that's really why we have phospholipid or sterol. Um, triglyceride is primarily to supply energy. Um, there's something else I wanted to say, now it's escaping me. Um, remember we said triglycerides are, or maybe we didn't say this, but triglycerides are the most abundant of the three, especially in our food. Um, and that's because we make cholesterol and we make phospholipids. So if we eat fat, primarily we're eating it for triglycerides. Um, and we're eating it for those essential fatty acids, which are also triglycerides. And those, remember your omega-3 and your omega, this is another way to write omega, your omega-6s, those make those eicosanoids that um, facilitate the inflammation um, processes. And then this is important to know too, we do store fat. I said that already, I think in the last two chapters. So we do store fat and when we store fat, we're again storing triglyceride. So we'll store triglyceride in our adipose tissue. That's that like endless reserve of fat storage. But we will also store a little bit of triglyceride in our muscles called intramuscular fat. Um, this is the case for anyone, um, particularly though endurance athletes who are highly trained might actually have quite a bit of intramuscular fat because as they're out there for hours and hours on end, their working muscles are gonna rely on a lot of fat to supply energy. So it becomes actually quite um, advantageous for those muscles to have stored some triglyceride right there in between the muscle fibers. Okay, so we've talked a lot about fat emulsification. I think this is probably the first picture I've shown, however, of fat emulsification. So up top you see this large fat droplet. You can see it's composed of lots of individual triglycerides. Here you have your bile salts. So remember bile contains some phospholipids, so some water soluble parts and some fat soluble parts. So the bile salts are gonna be able to take this large fat droplet and, and separate it apart into these smaller fat droplets. Now, now that we have these smaller fat droplets, our fat digesting enzymes can actually work. So once we have small fat droplets, pancreatic lipase, so this is a fat digesting enzyme produced by the pancreas, will actually be able to digest these triglycerides. So you see, um, you'll see in this bottom picture, this triglyceride is starting to be broken apart into the um, monoglyceride right here. Oh, sorry, that's not the monoglyceride. The monoglyceride includes this whole part, actually. Sorry, I'm just gonna highlight it. So this is the monoglyceride, right? It's attached to one fatty acid chain anymore. And then the other two fatty acids got separated out, right? Free fatty acid and free fatty acid. So that is what pancreatic lipase can do, is break the triglyceride down into the monoglyceride and the two free fatty acids. Okay, and again, still we'll talk about the micelle and the chylomicron. So the micelle, remember this is inside the lumen of the small intestine. So the micelle is this packaging of all of these end products of lipid digestion. So cholesterol esters, cholesterols, free fatty acids, and monoglycerides. These are all fat soluble compounds. So um, they need to get packaged together with some little, um, like end products of, of phospholipid digestion. 
and they, they make this again hydrophilic and hydrophobic compound that can then actually be absorbed into the enterocyte. So once inside the enterocyte, they dissociate again. It doesn't really show it, but they, they break apart again. And now on the next slide, we'll see that the chylomicron, this would be now inside the enterocyte, the chylomicron forms. And the chylomicron is very similar to the um, micelle. Um, it, it's a repackaging of the triglycerides, the cholesterols, the cholesterol esters, so that they can then be transported throughout the body. So again, important to note that the outside of the chylomicron is composed of proteins and phospholipids. These are both water soluble. You can see down here in this picture, you got proteins and phospholipids. So making this something that can very much travel in the bloodstream quite easily, but inside is housed all these fats, all these end products of lipid digestion, and they're gonna be transported through the blood to the different body cells to provide energy, or potentially provide, um, again, some essential fatty acids. So the micelle gets absorbed from the gut lumen into the enterocyte. Remember the micelle will dissociate um, into the, all these components of lipid digestion, phospholipid, cholesterol, free fatty acids, monoglycerols, glycerol. Um, Remember, we just said that the short and medium chain fatty acids can be absorbed directly into the blood. They don't go into lymph, they can go right into the blood. Remember I said lipoproteins could carry um, these short and medium chain fatty acids. So albumin is, is a transport protein. It will help transport these short chain fatty acids and medium chain from the enterocyte to the blood. And then coming back over to all these other components of fat digestion, so the triglycerides, uh, yeah, all of these guys need to get packaged up into a chylomicron. So any longer chain fatty acids, the cholesterol remnants, the phospholipids, the monoglycerides, the glycerols, they all package up into a chylomicron and they get absorbed into the lymph, which will eventually drain into the blood. We will revisit chylomicrons again when we talk about cardiovascular disease at the end of this lecture. So, um, as I said, we can store fat. We, we store fat in our adipose tissue. So I do expect you to understand that adipose tissue is stored fat, and it's primarily storage for triglycerides. We can see some adipose, like intramuscular adipose, intramuscular fat storage, um, and again, that is a source of energy. So remember, carbohydrates and fats are the two primary sources of energy for our bodies. So here's a fat cell. So you see all the fat um, lipid components, and then the nucleus kind of gets pushed off to the side. All right. So what do we do with fat once we absorb it? Remember, I said we've said energy a bunch of times now. We also have already talked about this concept of energy density. So energy density is simply referring to the amount of calories per gram. So we've said that fat is the most energy dense of our three macronutrients, and that's because per gram, fat provides nine calories. Whereas for carbohydrates and protein, one gram of carbohydrate and one gram of protein provide only four calories. So fat is the most energy dense. It's a very good source of energy. So we use fat um, for fuel. This is primarily at rest and during endurance exercise. We can store fat. Um, we've talked about the, the necessity of eating the essential fatty acids in our foods, the omega-6 fatty acids, specifically linoleic acid, and the omega-3 fatty acid, lino, alpha-linolenic acid. Um, we need both of those to help regulate our inflammatory pathways um, some of our vitamins are only fat soluble, so we do need fat in the body to be able to absorb our fat soluble vitamins. Um, we can now see, now that we have the example of um, our reproductive hormones, our essential fatty acids, the job of phospholipids in terms of being a component of bile salts, um, building the phospholipid bilayer in our cell membranes, um, yeah, we now, we've now talked about several different functions of fats. 
um, and how they regulate our body processes. The phospholipid bilayer, fat can also be protective, actually. We do have small amounts of fat that cushion different parts of our bodies um, and that actually protect our vital organs in the abdomen. And then in food, fat is actually the part of our food that contributes a lot of flavor as well as texture. And flavor in part because a lot of our flavor compounds like herbs or spices that we might use, a lot of the actual chemical compounds that are so flavorful are fat soluble. So we do need fat to help make those flavors um, like actually available to us to taste. So this I think is a, a pretty helpful chart just showing um, over time as we're exercising. So one, two, three hours, four hours, our bodies will use varying amounts of, of energy substrates. So there's four different energy substrates written on this chart. There's a glucose that's free flowing in your blood, right? We've talked about blood glucose levels. There's glucose that's stored in your liver and your muscle as glycogen. There's glucose, oh, sorry, there are fatty acids um, in our adipose tissue. And then there are fatty acids in our muscle adipose. So what I want you to take away from this is that as we exercise, um, as the duration of the exercise increases, we start to use a whole lot more stored fat. And we, we will also start to use more of our blood glucose, which is something we don't really want to do. So you'll see by, by that fourth hour, we've used up all of our muscle glycogen. That's gone down to zero, right? So what's left by that fourth hour, we have plenty of reserves here in our, in our adipose, stored adipose tissue. You'll see we've also started to use up our muscle triglyceride by that time. So these are going to be muscle triglyceride and muscle glycogen are going to be the first two, right? Basically, number one, number one. These are going to be the first two sources of energy. And then as time goes on, we're going to start using um, stored adipose and we're going to start using um, blood glucose. Remember at this point, if we get to hour four and we've used up this much blood glucose, we would, we would call this hypoglycemic, right? Hypoglycemic, where we were probably really, really low blood glucose by this point, um, unless you've had a snack and replaced your blood glucose levels. Alrighty, and then how much do we eat, right? How much fat should we eat? So remember the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges. So for fat, it's 20 to 35% of our total calories. So of all the calories you eat in a day, 20 to 35% of those calories should come from fat. The suggestion is to minimize saturated fat and trans fat intake. Doing this will help lower the risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, this is kind of irrelevant at this point, but kind of in maybe in the 90s and the early 2000s, we thought that fat was really bad for us. So people and scientists even were advocating for very low fat diets. Um, this is not recommended anymore, primarily because fat intake of that, that small an amount would likely lead to deficiency in the essential fatty acids. This EFA is essential fatty acids. We do have BRI's dietary, in, dietary reference intake values set for our omega-3s. So for linoleic acid, it's at 5 to 10% of total energy. So that's, uh, if you have 20 to 20, 20 to 35% of your total calories, this is saying the first 10% of, of these, of this 20% or of this 35%, that should come from linoleic acid. And then alpha linolenic acid, it's pretty low AMDR. It's only 0.6 to 1.2% of energy. Um, and again, you can look on your food labels and your nutrition facts panels to see these listed. And this is an important piece too. So trying to keep these two um, essential fatty acids in a healthy ratio to one another. So the suggestion is at least a five to one or sorry, I should say at least a 10 to one, if not even a five to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. So the reason for this is because in the United States, the reason we even have this recommendation right here 
is because in the United States, we eat a lot of omega-6 fatty acids, at the, oftentimes at the expense of omega-3 fatty acids. So remember I said omega-6s we find in like our, pretty much all of our vegetables and any vegetable oil, any seeds. Linoleic acid is really abundant in our food. Whereas the omega-3 fatty acids, this alpha-linolenic acid, is really not very abundant. Remember I said that there's only a few food sources of omega-3s. Fish, and specifically cold water, salt water fish, not freshwater, lake water fish. So fish, and then a select few of plant foods. Walnuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, and then some, to a much lesser extent, some seeds like pumpkin seeds, um, and we also talked about dark green leafy vegetables. So in the United States, over the past several decades, we've started to recognize that people are eating a lot of omega-6s, like on the order of a 50 to 1 ratio, and they're eating very, very few omega-3 fatty acids. So the recommendation is to try to even that out a little bit more. So start eating, I would, my recommendation would be to include something from this omega-3 food category in your daily diet. Um, and then these two, this is a two, two, um, two pager here. So these are two really helpful charts just showing you um, the food sources of DHA and EPA and then total omega-3. So this, you can think of this as the alpha linolenic acid. Um, so you'll see where this, these lists of foods is just gonna be nuts, seeds, and fish, really. Um, and you'll notice, I'll just highlight the, um, nuts and seeds. This is flax oil. So this is the oil from the flax seed. You notice it's really rich in omega-3s in omega -3s and ALA. Um, this is grams per serving. But as we said, there's no DHA and no EPA in the plant foods. So here's whole flax seed. Here's canola oil. That's the rapeseed. And here's uh, walnuts. So you'll see these are all good sources of ALA, but they all have zero EPA and DHA. Oops, sorry, I highlighted the wrong one. Whereas if we look at the fish, you'll see, doesn't want to change. If we look at the fish, so you got salmon oil, herring, salmon, sardines, um, trout. So I suppose you could find trout in lake. You'll see it's a little bit lower than um, the salmon or the herring. There's a halibut and shrimp. So these are gonna provide even less, but what they are providing is DHA and EPA, right? Sardine, sardine oil, you're gonna get a good amount of EPA and DHA. Same with salmon oil, really rich in DHA and EPA. So that's the difference. Remember we said that our bodies can make DHA and EPA. Um, the conversion rate is potentially slow, potentially limited. Um, otherwise, we can eat DHA and EPA directly by eating fish. Um, and then the chart just continues here. So take a look on your own time. Uh, even spinach, I'll just highlight that one, right? So spinach is added here at the end. Tiny bit of omega-3s. Again, not going to have EPA or DHA. So the recommendation to limit saturated fat, what does that mean? Remember the dietary guidelines for Americans. We saw, this, we saw this when we looked at how, how to put together a healthy diet overall. The suggestion is less than 10% of total calories. Um, so again, when we look at, let me go back here. So we're saying total fat. So total fat, we're saying 20 to 35%. We're saying that we can divvy that up. So we could say maybe, let's just go with 10% is gonna come from um, your omega-6. Let's just say that 1% is gonna come from your omega-3. We're gonna say that not more than another 10% is gonna come from saturated fat. And so now, now total, we've got 21, right? Now we've got 21. So we've actually already met the low end of the AMPR if, we, if you hit all those on a high total. 
um, what's missing, right? The only other thing that hasn't been included in here are the monounsaturated fats. There isn't really a recommendation around monounsaturated fats. There are also other um, polyunsaturated fats. So, you know, theoretically that leaves another 14% um, if you're gonna have 35% of your total calories coming from fat. So that's what these numbers mean. It's not 10% of this 20%, it's just um, of, if that makes any sense, <laughs> you can kind of add up the percentages to get to a total of 20 to 35% total fat. Um, the American Heart Association recommends actually even less than that uh, for saturated fat. So they recommend actually five to six percent of energy intake for saturated fat. And then trans fat, there is no there is no nutritional requirement for these. In fact, these are very harmful to the body. So the recommendation is to eliminate or avoid trans fats. How do we limit saturated fats? So uh, one with several ways, right? You could eat more fish and legumes as your protein source because these are going to be virtually devoid of saturated fat. You can definitely choose lower cut fats of meat and poultry, but there's still going to be saturated fat in there. You could switch to like um, grilling, baking, broiling. You could use the old uh, air fryer if you have one of those or steaming or boiling even instead of frying. You can switch to using oils that are going to be richer in mono and polyunsaturated fats instead of using butter, margarine, or lard. And you can switch to low fat or non fat dairy or switch to plant based milk products um, because, again, there will be no saturated fats. Just to review, when we talked about food labeling, we talked about these terms fat free, low fat, reduced or less fat, and light. So, again, just making note that any of these terms the food still contains fat, right? Something fat-free is still going to contain a little bit of fat, less than half a gram per serving, per serving for all these. So just remember to keep these in mind when you're selecting, you know, what foods to eat. If you're trying to be mindful of your fat intake, your total fat intake or your saturated fat intake. Also, we should be aware of fat replacement in food. So um, some food manufacturers have taken fat out of their food to, to lower the content of fat in the food. Um, but fat replacers aren't always good for us. Sometimes they are fiber-based, so they're carbohydrate-based, or sometimes they're protein-based. So sometimes they can actually be good for us, um, but sometimes they're carbohydrate-based and they are just added sugars. So sometimes they're not good for us. So be cautious of the nutrient profile um, and how how that may change in either a healthful way or a not healthful way when fat replacement is added. So again, these terms, if you see fat free, low fat, reduced fat, there might be some sort of fat replacer in there that allows that food to be fat free or low fat. So I would suggest check the ingredients list because then you'll be able to see, you'll be able to guess at least what went in there to replace the fat. Um, yeah, remember we said that fat makes food pretty tasty. It makes it kind of thicker and creamier and it can help us help bring out the taste of the food. So when we take fat out of food, uh, sometimes we lose some of that palatability. And that's why a lot of times, oftentimes, sugar gets added in its place. Um, Another one of these helpful charts, this is yet another thing you could do uh, for your My Diet analysis is to try to have less saturated fat in your diet, right? So some things you could do choosing, um, let's see, what have they done here? So they've eliminated the bacon instead of frying the egg, they scrambled the egg. Um, some things you could do for fiber, so they switched from white toast to whole wheat toast. And instead of butter, they used olive oil. Uh, they also used a skim milk instead of a whole milk. At lunch, they used uh, fish instead of beef in the burger, um, reduced fat mayo. And then they have fresh veggies on the side instead of French fries. I mean, they do have some chips, but hopefully it's fewer chips. <laughs> and then they have water as a beverage too. At dinner, again, they're using salmon instead of a meat. 
Um, they're using brown rice rather than corn, broccoli, um, but really it's the salmon, I guess, that would reduce the saturated fat because they do use butter. Um, and they've got more vegetables in here in this soup. So you'll see the total saturated fat comes in at 16% of energy on the left, and it's only 5% of calories on the right. So this is great. This keeps it less than 10% of total calories, whereas on the right, you're more than 10%. Um, also interesting, if we look at total calories from fat, it's 39% over here. So that's above the AMDR. Remember the AMDR is 20 to 35. So that's way above the AMDR, whereas this one on the right is 28%. So that's right in line. So that's great. Um, again, on the Nutrition Facts panel, you'll see the sections for fat and cholesterol. Cholesterol kind of gets its own line, even though it is a type of lipid. But here's where you'll be able to see trans fat should always be zero. And then you'll be able to see saturated poly and monounsaturated. Um, you'll, again, the saturated fat has a percent daily value. But it, again, percent daily value can be a little bit confusing because you would actually need to add all these percentages up to 100. Because it's not saying this is 10, you know, this is 6%, like almost 10% of 10% of your total calories. This is saying, unless you're really a math person, I, I think percentages can get so confusing. And yeah, anyway, so percent daily value, this is 6% of 100% where the 100% is the 10% of your total calories. Right, so if you only have this one gram of saturated fat, you could actually still have about, you know, technically close to 90% more saturated fat. Um, you'll see that polyunsaturated and monounsaturated don't have a percent daily value. Um, I don't actually really know why that is, but it's not on there. And then total fat, of course, has its percent daily value too. So this was a lower saturated fat. Oh, these were reduced fat wheat crackers. So that's why total fat was lower. Saturated fat was about the same though. Okay, so now we can talk about um, cardiovascular disease. So a disease associated with lipids in the body. So cardiovascular, cardio meaning heart, vascular meaning your blood vessels. So it's a dysfunction of the heart or the blood vessels. Cardiovascular disease, abbreviated CVD, is one of the leading causes of death in the United States, uh, or is the leading cause of death in the United States. And death can occur via stroke or um, myocardial infarction or a heart attack. So either of those is blockage of the blood vessel. Um, heart attack is when the blood vessel that supplies the heart becomes blocked. And stroke is when the blood vessels that supply the brain become blocked. So in either case, if you lose blood flow to the brain or you lose blood flow to the heart because the vessels are blocked, you can see sometimes permanent damage to the brain or permanent damage to the heart after the heart attack or after the stroke. And then hypertension, so again, hyper high tension, referring to the pressure in your blood vessels. When hypertension, when high blood pressure is present, that makes the risk for heart attack or stroke even higher. Um, and again, that should make sense if you just give pause for a second to think about it. Because as you have more pressure flowing through these vessels, they're going to be more likely to um, burst or become blocked because there's a, such a high passage of fluid through the vessels. Other risk factors for cardiovascular disease, um, being overweight or obese, um, specifically obesity, I should say, not necessarily being overweight. Um, physical inactivity, so not being physically active, smoking. Um, type 2 diabetes, inflammation, and having unhealthy cholesterol levels. Abnormal blood lipids is generally referring to having high blood cholesterol. So all of these are lifestyle factors, which means that there is a lot that we can do to prevent and avoid cardiovascular disease. So this is a really helpful chart, I think. Um, We'll go through from top to bottom, but this is looking at how plaque, which is that like 
kind of buildup of debris in the lining of the blood vessel walls, how that forms. So at the beginning at the top here, we're looking at a healthy artery. Uh, over here in the top right, you'll see a cross section of this healthy artery. You'll see the lining, the wall of the artery. And you'll see it's super clear here in the middle. Nothing obstructing the blood flow. So you can have smooth, steady, easy blood flow through those vessels. So then the, the initiation of this process of plaque formation begins here where something injures the lining of the, of the blood vessel wall. And so when we get an injury, like anywhere else in the body, immune cells are gonna come and the process of inflammation is going to begin. So let me just jump back here and say that, in particular, two of the like, easiest ways to damage the blood vessel walls is having hyperglycemia, which is type two diabetes, and cigarette smoking, right? So in either of these cases, we have an excessive amount of particles flowing through the blood. Again, the example of type 2, di type 2 diabetes is hyperglycemia, high blood glucose levels. All of those extra glucose molecules flowing through the blood that shouldn't be there, they can cause damage to the lining of the blood vessel wall. So we don't often think, oh, you know, if you're diabetic, shoot, be careful, you might get cardiovascular disease. But in fact, being type 2 diabetes can be a major risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. Again, same with cigarette smoking. Um, yeah, so what happens to that injury? So just like any other injury, we're going to try to fix it. So we're going to bring immune cells like our white blood cells and we're gonna cause inflammation at that site to try to fix it. We're also gonna see cholesterol compounds, these low density lipoproteins coming to the site of injury. Because in fact, some of the components, some of the cholesterols and other lipids in the LDL would help to um, heal the injury. We've said that, uh, well, we've said briefly, Right, we've got the phospholipid bilayer that makes up any cell membrane. We do also have cholesterol molecules that exist in our cell membranes to maintain the membrane integrity. So the, the LDL is coming there. That's a natural part of the, the healing response. The issue is actually only just if we have too many LDLs otherwise floating in the blood. That's where it becomes dangerous. Because if we have too many of those LDLs, they, can be, they do oxidize easily. And we'll talk about oxidation in unit three, but um, oxidiza oxid oxidization uh, is basically like something going bad, like something spoiling. So these LDLs can actually go bad. And when that happens, it like furthers this immune response process. So the LDLs are kind of like a double-edged sword. Like we need them there to um, enhance the healing process. But if there's too many of them, they can actually cause more harm than good. So the lipid accumulates in the wall. That's what's happening here. All these lipids, you can see this is the, the lining. And you can see it starts to kind of push out and push out and push out. And now you've got all these foam cells and lipid accumulation inside the lining of the blood vessel wall. So we start to call that like a fatty streak. where We have this accumulation of foam cells. Um, and they are producing these toxic and inflammatory chemicals. So this becomes a pretty, kind of like a hot mess, if you will. And then ultimately we call that plaque. So foam cells along with platelets, calcium, protein fibers, and other substances form this deposit, this thick deposit that we call plaque. And if we, if we look down here in the bottom right of the cross section of this blood vessel, this is the plaque formation. So you can see in comparison to the top, the one up top has so much beautiful space for blood to flow through. In the bottom, we've lost almost half of the space in the lumen of the blood vessel for blood to flow through. So all this buildup of plaque starts to obstruct the flow of the blood through the blood vessel. This plaque, this plaque actually can also rupture itself and the plaque itself can clog the artery. 
um, or the plaque can squeeze off so much space that blood can actually just stop flowing through. And that's where you would get heart attack or stroke. So having too, too much saturated fat and cholesterol will raise your blood lipid profiles and increase the likelihood of that plaque formation and the potential for the plaque to rupture. Um, same with trans fats. We have said that omega-3s are actually cardioprotective, so the omega-3 fatty acids reduce inflammation, um, and they can help actually even reduce the amount of triglycerides in your blood too. So all this whole process here of inflammation, if we have enough omega-3 fatty acids in our diet, we can actually counteract this pro-inflammatory response quite well. So that's again a, another reason to make sure you're getting enough omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. So let's talk about these blood lipids because we've mentioned this a bunch. You've probably heard of LDL and HDL, low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins. We also talked about chylomicron already. That's what that's how the fat particles get packaged after a meal in the enterocyte and then sent out into the blood. So blood lipids, this is akin to blood glucose. This is just how we transport lipids through our bodies. Because lipids are fat soluble, they're not water soluble, they won't bind directly to the blood cells. So we need to have these transport, kind of like buses basically, we need to have these transport mechanisms to get blood, uh, excuse me, to get fat through the blood to various parts of the body. So all of these, chylomicron, very low density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, and high density lipoprotein are basically transport molecules for fat in the blood. Um, and again, lipoprotein, proteins are water soluble, lipo are lipid soluble. So this, um, the proteins allow it to travel in the blood and the lipo carries the fat. Alrighty, so we'll start with the chylomicron because we've talked about this a bunch. So the chylomicron is formed in, again, the enterocyte after the meal. It gets released into the lymph and then travels into the blood. It is the largest of the lipoproteins. It has the lowest density. So density is determined by the relative percentage of protein to total fat. So the, and remember these are lipoproteins. So they're gonna have lipids and they're gonna have fats. So the more protein is in the um, lipoprotein, the higher the density. I'll jump down here to the bottom really briefly. The high density lipoprotein, this is the most dense, it has the most protein. Protein is more dense than fat. And now this isn't calorie density, this is just the density of the um, mass, the density of the compound itself. So proteins, we'll see these in chapter six, you'll see they're these super intense complex structures. They're very dense, whereas fats are a little more light and wavy. So fats are not dense. So when we have a high um, density of triglyceride, the density of the overall um, transport or lipoprotein is low. So where it's lowest density, you know it has high triglyceride. So the purpose of the chylomicron, again, is to transport fat from the food we ate to various tissues of the body. Um, let's jump back down here to HDL because HDL has kind of um, an opposite job. HDL is made by the liver and released into the blood, and its job is to actually pick up cholesterol from different body cells that, that no longer need cholesterol. So high density lipoprotein is gonna be primarily protein, and then whatever amount of cholesterol it can pick up, it's gonna bring that back to the liver to get rid of it probably, either turn it into bile um, or, or still turn it into bile, but let it be um, potentially eliminated by the rest of the digestive system. So then the very low density lipoproteins and the low density lipoproteins. So let's start with VLDL. So these are also made in the liver. Some of them, a small amount of VLDL is made in the intestine. And these are again, these are all transport molecules. So L VLDLs are still transporting lipids, still mostly triglyceride, um, still to various parts of the body. 
So after a meal, you know, the chyle micron goes out. Once it's given away all that it can give away, it's going to travel back to the liver to get, you know, dismantled. But then a few hours later, the liver might say, okay, we still have some triglycerides and other um, lipid compounds to go out, so let's make an, a VLDL. So, all right, still mostly triglyceride, a little more protein at this point, um, maybe a little more phospholipid, maybe a little more cholesterol. So let's go pass this around to the body. And then um, as the VLDL travels through the body, it's going to give off that triglyceride and actually become a, an LDL. So LDL is formed in the blood as the VLDL um, gives off triglycerides. So as triglycerides are removed from the VLDL. So triglycerides are going to go down to 8% from 52%. So now you'll see the density of this compound is getting, um, getting a little bit more dense. All right, you'll see protein is going up from 10% to 22% here, not quite to the 50% of the HDL. Um, but you'll also see it's in the LDL. Let me change my color here. It's in the LDL that the cholesterol content is the highest, right? Cholesterol up here is 5. Cholesterol here is 20. Cholesterol at the end is 17. Whereas cholesterol here is 50%. So the function of the LDL is really to transport cholesterol to the body. Now, remember, we've said cholesterol can make our reproductive hormones, make vitamin D makes components of bile salts. Cholesterol is also an integral component of our cell membranes. So we do need cholesterol. Remember, we make cholesterol. So the more cholesterol we eat from our diet, the more of these LDLs we're gonna have floating around, right? So that's where this, that's where we have this opportunity here is if we have a ton of LDLs in our body, the only, or if we have a lot of LDLs that have a lot of cholesterol in them. The only way we're gonna have too much cholesterol is if we've eaten too much cholesterol or potentially if we're really, really physically inactive. So I know this is a lot here. Um, you don't need to know the VLDLs as much, but definitely need to understand chylomicron, LDL, and HDL. And definitely feel free to email me if, you, if you'd like any more clarification on any of these. Um, this is also helpful just reviewing what we just said, but it's kind of showing you how each of these lipoproteins are giving away the various fat components. So the chylomicron made in the enterocyte, giving away fats and glycerol, primarily to muscle and adipose. The chylomicron remnant, the remnants, the remains of the chylomicron travel back to the liver. Remember I said a short while later, the liver might make some VLDL if we need to distribute more fatty acids to the muscle or to the adipose. As the VLDL gives away its triglycerides, it becomes more concentrated in cholesterol. So the LDL is giving away cholesterol. And then the, what remains of the LDL will go back to the liver. And then eventually the liver is also going to make high density lipoproteins. And high density lipoproteins, remember, they're mostly protein. They don't have a lot of cholesterol on them, but their job is to pick up cholesterol, kind of like the trash collectors. And they're going to pick up cholesterol that cells don't need anymore. And they're going to take that cholesterol back to the liver to be recycled or eliminated. And again, eliminated from the body through bile. So I don't know if I've put it in here too much, but. And I, now I can't remember if we said it or not, but I think we did in chapter four when we talked about having a high fiber diet. We said that, yeah, we did in chapter four. We said that um, in the in the gut, in the large intestine, primarily, or even the small intestine, I guess technically, um, if we have a high fiber meal, the fiber in the meal can actually bind the bile, specifically some of the cholesterol from the bile, and actually. So, so the fiber will stick to that cholesterol and pull that cholesterol out in our feces. So when we say that HDL helps eliminate or recycle um, bile, we still actually need to have a high fiber diet to make that possible. Otherwise, the liver will make bile from this leftover cholesterol, but we saw that in a low fiber diet, that cholesterol just gets reabsorbed back into the body. So 
still need fiber for that process to happen. Okay, so um, earlier I said that obesity, physical inactivity, smoking, inflammation, type 2 diabetes, et cetera, all of these are lifestyle issues. So what are some lifestyle changes we can make to prevent or reduce cardiovascular disease? So again, um, be aware of total and saturated fat intake. Try to keep those according to the DRI. So we'll limit saturated fat to 10% or less and keep total fat in that 20 to 35% of total calories range. And then limit or avoid trans fats. Eat omega-3 fatty acids every day, right? Increase fiber to at least, <laughs> we've said a few different things for fiber now, but I would say bare minimum 25 grams a day. Um, we haven't talked about the B vitamins just yet. We will in uh, unit three, but B6, B12, and folate help um, build red blood cells, so keeping your red blood cells healthy. Uh, you can also reduce sodium intake, and you could eat smaller meals and snacks overall to reduce, again, the, um, the amount of VLDL or LDL production that your body's making. And less salt is going to help keep um, your blood pressure in a healthy range, right? Because too much salt can increase blood pressure. Again, eat, eat a good amount of plant foods because those plant sterols can also help reduce cholesterol in the body. Remember to manage your blood glucose levels well. So hyperglycemia can be a cause for cardiovascular disease. Maintain a healthy body weight. Maintain an active lifestyle. So move every day. Um, be mindful of alcohol intake and um, smoking cessation. And then there are medications, of course, to treat cardiovascular disease. This isn't really our conversation in nutrition. Um, really, nutrition aims to prevent these diseases of lifestyle before they even happen. Um, but we do have statins that can help um, reduce cholesterol. But it's interesting because they're reducing your endogenous cholesterol synthesis. Endogenous is what your body makes. But when you have, when a person has a, a high cholesterol level in the body, it's usually not because they make, some, sometimes it is. We're starting to see that maybe there is this case where some people make too much cholesterol, but usually people have too much cholesterol because they ate too much cholesterol, not because their body makes too much of it. So putting people on statins because they eat too much cholesterol seems kind of backwards, right? That's like putting a Band-Aid on, um, like, you know, a, a, an infected wound, right? You need to stop the infection. You can't just put a Band-Aid on it. So my recommendation would be to reduce cholesterol intake rather than reducing your body's natural production of cholesterol. Um, bile sequ sequestrants could also be given. Again, these are going to help pull some of the cholesterol out of the bile. Again, my recommendation here would just be to eat more fiber. Um, and then nicotinic acid may also be used, um, much less common than statins or bile acids sequestrants. Um, and then lastly here, we'll talk a little bit about high fat diets and cancer. This is still uh, like a probable relationship between high fat intake and breast, colon, and prostate cancer. But nonetheless, again, just like with cardiovascular disease, if there are some things we can do to reduce the risk of cancer, my suggestion would, say, would be why not? So these recommendations come from the American Institute for Cancer Research. You'll see they're pretty much the same as for cardiovascular disease prevention. So maintain a healthy body weight, Get at least 30 minutes of physical activity a day. Limit intake of sugary drinks and other empty calories. This is another term, kind of a random spot for me to highlight it, but um, this is another term that I do want you to know. Empty calorie is like the opposite of something that's nutrient dense. So it's where you have a lot of calories, but they're empty, meaning they're not providing any nutritional value. So the classic examples here are just like sodas, candies, pastries, cookies, cakes, pies, chips, hot dogs, you know, your, your fried processed sugary foods. You're going to get a lot of calories from them, but you're going to get nothing that's actually of value to your body. So limit intake of empty calories. It's good for everybody. And then again, eat a variety of whole fruits, beans, and vegetables. 
This is where you're going to get a lot of fiber, as well as antioxidants. Um, well, again, we'll talk about antioxidants in unit three, but if I were to go all the way back to that slide on plaque, for, uh, plaque formation, remember I said that the LDLs, if there's too many of them, they can become oxidized. And so um, having a high amount of antioxidants in the body could help prevent um, some of that oxidation, or at least to keep that oxidation to a minimum. Again, switch to whole grains so you get more fiber. Again, limit, keep calories within reason, limit saturated fat, limit added sugar, limit alcohol, and stop smoking. Okay, um, and then I think I, there's one slide out here. So come back to these questions because there's one little slide that got left behind. Not a very useful slide, but... Coming up in just a second. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know why this one got stuck in the back. I need to move him back forward. But just um, another interesting thing about fats to be aware of. So we could think about, we could, we could kind of say that in our food, we have visible fats and invisible fats. Visible fats, I would say, are like the obvious things that we might be adding to. So we might put butter on toast, or we might add cream to coffee, or you know, put mayonnaise on something or salad dressings are have a lot of oil um, or you put sour cream or whatever, or you choose high fat milks or cheeses, right? Or cheese, people put cheese on everything, literally everything. So visible fats are the fats that we add to food that are very obvious. Invisible fats are, I don't wanna say that they're more dangerous, but they go unnoticed more easily. So they're things that are already like mixed into a food. So a lot of baked goods are actually really high in fat, particularly saturated fat, but we don't often think about it because it's like, oh, it's a cookie, it's a treat, it's a sweet, but it's also a fat. It's a very high fat food. All of our dairy products and all of our meats are also pretty high in fat. Yes, it's better, it's good, it can be good to select a low fat option, but it's still gonna be high in fat and specifically saturated fat. And then a lot of our processed foods, so many hidden, uh, sorry, many yeah, invisible fats, hidden fats are added during processing. So any processed food, again, chips, um, hot dogs, hamburgers, et cetera, anything you're going to get at a fast food restaurant, anything that might be fried, there's going to be a lot of fat in that food, but it's going to be a little less obvious than like pouring olive oil on your salad as a salad dressing. So, um, some other things to, to be aware of. I won't test you on visible and invisible fats, but <clears throat> these are actually just kind of helpful FYIs again um, as you go about planning a healthy diet for yourself. So then um, we go back to the review question. So this is the end of the chapter five lecture. It feels like it kind of ended abruptly, but as usual, take your time to kind of go through these questions. Um, really great review questions for the chapter. Email me if you have any questions. And um, thank you for listening. We'll see you for chapter six.